from the research sites to the demonstration part and then also into the deployment of first industrial units such as pyrofineries. There are many obstacles that are being faced in this sector. But on the other hand, it's a very promising sector as well, as we know that this sector can contribute in a very positive way to our environment, to our climate, and to many more generations to come. So, what does it then take? We all know it needs a huge, but really a huge mobilization of funding, of capital, which not only affects large industry, but particularly with many SMEs in this beautiful sector. And we also know that risk taking, it's part of it, it's part of the game, but it's not easy. And we see financial institutions, national banks, bank for capitalists, private equity firms, all struggling with the question, do we want to take that risk for this particular sector? So we need to find ways to facilitate the access to finance in order to really realize the full potential of the bioeconomy in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, just a couple of practical details. It is good to know that the outcomes of this session will also be used at the end of the conference tomorrow, where we will showcase them to you, and those results will also be fed into a report, uh, a, a so-called conference report, with concrete recommendations to be uh, brought forward also by the joint undertaking CB. Also good to know for you, ladies and gentlemen, that we would like to interact with you. You've already seen you can happily take out your mobile phones and use Slido, but we want to make it as low threshold as possible. We're only also going to do it in a very old-fashioned way. Just raise your hand if you have a question. So I know Nathan, I think you're there somewhere. So that's Nathan, he has a microphone. Not sure if there's anyone else. Yeah. Yeah, also a microphone over there. So just raise your hand and we're really happy to take your questions on board because today it's not about a one-way street, we want to gather your feedback. And finally, good to know for you as well, how are we going to run this session? Well, we're first going to have a keynote speech. Thereafter, we're going to have a panel discussion with six panel members in total. We first present a general statement and then we really go into the interaction mode. And ladies and gentlemen, finally, not just for me, but hopefully also for you, I think it's really nice because the group is not so big that we start to get to know each other a little bit better. So, please raise your hands if you do not work and live in Brussels. Okay, that's a fair amount of people. Um, second question, you are an investor in the bio-based sector. Please raise your hands. Ooh, they're not so eager to raise their hands. No. Then the final question, I am here because of the following sequence. Drinking, eating, learning more about the bio-based sector. Okay, very good, very good, very good. You're a very good audience. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you the keynote of today, which is Piet Pitt, the Chief Development Officer of Fibonol on the Sweet Books Project. So, Piet, I'd like to say the floor is yours. Please give him a big hand. Good afternoon to everybody. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a finance sec session, but I'm not going to bore you much with the Excel tables and the numbers. But I will tell you honestly the story of getting from the lab to the first of the kind industrial plant and what it means from <coughs> very different angles uh, being in the role of investor and uh, getting into the point of market of it. So, yeah, here is the one. How Fibonol. So, uh, I think most of you might have heard Sweetwoods Project. So, Sweetwoods Project is the support uh, project name from the PBI and now CBE. And together with the PIC and uh, Fibonol today, I will give you a short intro of the Fibonol, where we are today, to put all this into a better context. So, Fibonol we call today enabler of the change, transformation from the fossils to sustainable. And what we provide to the industry is the 
premium scope three sustainable raw materials. And now is the question how and how fast it could be implemented in different sectors. So it's not working. Now it's working. So I started with this uh, journey 2016, scouting the world for two years, looking at the different technologies and what we knew is that we want to do differently. So we don't want to copy paste what has been done before, but let's take a different look. And uh, we selected technology from the US that allows that. Seven years later, a uh, little bit less than 100 million euros uh, spent. That's the plan that we have. Uh, that's the future of the bio industry on the hardwood based. But just to show you that it's not a garage what we're doing, it's a real industrial scale demonstration with all of its goods and bats. So in Fibonol we are not just the factory, one, one factory project. We have evolved into modular concept of the future of the fire and fiber. We have integrated into this concept already the nuances that we know that are coming with the Green Deal and with the planetary boundaries of socially, environmentally and economically acceptable weight. So just for example, uh, today we already have the wastewater treatment that collects all the water, treats it in a way that we can recycle in 95% uh, of that. Nobody's regulative framework asking that. 100% renewable energy base. The technology allows to take 90% of the wood to convert it into usual, useful products of lignova, lignin, wood sugars, and especially cellulose. And obviously, the upstream side, I think this is the hygiene, le hygiene level, that sustainable forest management practices, sustainable harvesting rates in the local and also the uh, country level. Without that, also being able to trace and track it, you can forget it. So, cradle to gate, fully transparent, fully traceable, fully trackable, and we are developing now also digitally identifiable, verifiable CO2 footprint calculation. Something that you need to have. What is important to note that we started by licensing the technology from the US. Uh, this year we have turned into the IP and technology owners. So we're not just building the plant, but we're building the plant. So also EPC model that to hand over into different regions of the world where the hardwood is used. So where we are today with the capacity is 30,000 tons a year of wood uh, converted into the products that we have. Uh, obviously, first year is going to be a ramp up year, but the kind of general average capacity is 20,000 tons a year of cellulosic sugars, 6,500 tons of lignova, and specialty cellulose on demand. EPD, we have already done, although there is no standard, we have set ourselves a standard. And the first one is that we have the environmental product declaration that is used in the construction industry. This is the basis for future, how to separate good from the bad, better from the worse. And why we're doing it in the end, these are the value chains that we're already addressing, where we have demonstrations done, where the technology works, where the process works, and it all comes down one thing, the economics in the end. Maybe this is something new, so we all know that there is a value of, test of the technology, and uh, you have heard about it a lot. Well, surprise, surprise, it's not only one. So uh, if you are in the lab scale, first of all, you have the technology value of test. So we have come now in six years from the point of the technology value of test. Investors, we are private equity based. So uh, all the money is coming from the previous 20 year experience of the wood pellet industry. It was sold to one of the largest, uh, one of the large investor funds and the equity is now used for this technology venture. Six years, COVID, Russian invasion, and all the other things that have happened in the world. So this is the kind of ultimate challenge to make it happen. And what you need for that is a persistent money. If we would have been corporate based, VC based, I think this project would be closed a few years ago. 
but persistently knowing that this is the road that you need to go. You have the end target, and the end target is not the 2023. This is the project now we have permission. End target is 2028. And why I say that we have the second value of theft? Because for the banks, we are now technolo technologically bankable. We could get the funding, but the second question is where is the off -take? And that we don't have the value of theft of the market regulation financing is we have a green deal. But for the chemical and materials industry, the Green Deal is not yet realized in the mandate for the market for these kind of products. Because we are in the infancy of the industry, it's not just us. I think the, everybody here, everybody getting the funding from the CB, we are doing first steps. Economy of scale, we need to get there. So in the beginning, our sustainable raw materials pricing is higher than is fossils and, that, and is the con conventional industry. We need the pull from the market. Certain kind of mandate that these kind of products are integrated into the economy. I will make it into two pieces. So for us it started 2018 as a licensing and basically investment decision when we got also the Sweetwoods funding. So I think the CV is doing very good work in putting throughout the value chain different parties together. And also the third party validation that if the project is just our dream that we want to do it or the third party validated that okay, we are ready to put the public money in. So it definitely helps. Uh, we got around 30 million euros uh, of the subsidy to ourselves. Today it's 100 million euros already. In the end it's not that big of the capex part but just building the ecosystem and helping us to get through the decision making. So the green part is the kind of uncertainty, risk of uncertainty. We had also very many points where we we were just hoping that let's hope it works and it worked out. So we but it all needs let's say the owners and the investors that understand the drill of bringing something new alive in the industry. This if somebody comes and asks that uh, what would you uh, do uh, again, or how would you uh, approach this project again? I would say think twice because this is 24 7 for the whole time to try to struggle it out and make it happen. <coughs> from the financing viewpoint, so Sunburst license you can count from 2018 to 2013 was when the Sweetwater Energy started with this technology development. So it's not just what we have done, it was five years before, family pools, and what is the third? Uh, uh, that has been uh, financed them. We bought the first license, scaled it up, but for them it means that they had exactly zero revenue during the time from 2013 to 2023. And 2023 was the time when we got the uh, rights of the IP and technology. So this is one way from the lab to the demonstration. There are different options how to persist and then is the first license and then you have a decision if you try to get the funding to build the first plant ourselves or then you try to buy, find the guys like us to build it up but then it's again question how to survive the five years so I think we need a little bit of innovation also how we fund these kind of uh, projects because we cannot just take kind of uh, approach also I would say that the biotechnology is a bit different because the, in the end it's about strains, not that much of the capex that you need to put on the ground. 2023 we are up and running, 2024 is the year where we need to target 5,000 hours a, a year of operation to get technologically banked up. And that's quite a long time without much of a revenue and by the end of 2024 we hope to get to the place where we are self-sufficient at least the costs covered by our own production and sales and then next step is the five years until we get the 2028 plant up and running under condition that we get the market pull to get the funding from the banks because it's a 1 billion euro investment well my pockets are not that big we need the banks the banks we need the offtake it means we need Mandate. And this is the ambition that we have, own and operate plants together with the licensing. But this is, let's say at the moment, a little bit will probably be delayed because of the FID, the second value of the 
uh, well, they have that regulation on the one hand uh, from supporting this kind of innovation on the market, regulation on the other hand not stop hindering or stopping the hindering of innovation getting to the market. So a uh, very good idea that I uh, came along with just a few days ago was uh, like a tax-free zone. Let's make regulation-free zone for innovation in the Green Deal. Let's see how things come out. Let's collaboratively analyze and based on that make the regulation instead of regulating the innovation to death before we even get the chance. Maybe a good idea to think about. And then a few more points. So uh, the mandate, I think I have already talked about the regulate, regulator side again. And in the end, for me, the Green Deal is a kind of a large perception of being within the planetary boundaries. So let, we need to agree what is within the planetary boundaries and what not. And carbon emissions, CO2 footprint is one thing very good to measure. But CO2 footprint is definitely not the whole picture. Externalities, so what, what people are expecting from the innovation like we do today, perfection. All the externalities are put inside renewable energy, uh, local supply chains, traceable, trackable, lower CO2 footprint, resource efficiency in every step. But this, all these steps add on cost if we are comparing against no externalities. And then CO2 footprint is a kind of a measure today, but it's a wide, wide west chemical materials industry. There is no standard how to uh, how to measure the CO2. Everybody calculates in its own way. But if this is the final measure, it means you cannot compare apples to apples. And then the externalities, all the externalities that we expect from the green deal and future of the bio industry. We should start asking those also from the from the existing industry. I think this is the we have been a lot of discussing with the large industry corporate players, and what this represents for me is the nice green slide. Promises for 2030, promises for 2035, but there is nobody moving today, and there are nobody moving because there is no demand at the regulative side. Very good example for me is the sustainable aviation fuel, where now a European Commission has said 2025, 2% needs to be bio-based, we don't care. And the 2% is very ambitious because we have today 1% available. It means that we see that all the airports, airlines, the technology guys are behind one table discussing how we get to the point, because the penalties, if you don't meet this 2%, is very high. It's double the price that is the uh, cost the, uh, <coughs> difference between the boss side and the bio today. So we, we need this kind of uh, technology. Uh, what is this? Uh, Heaven playing field. Yeah. Not the technology, certain technology related, related, but the technology ambition. Uh, you know what I mean. So uh, uh, we need this kind of uh, motivation schemes. Second part, uh, we know that there's a very good, very large footprint in the uh, fossil industry, but there's no way how to measure it and how to compare it. Okay, so one minute, maybe more. So we need to get numbers, primary database numbers also from the conventional industries that we compare to. Otherwise, again, the playing field is very complicated. comes to financing, so the CO2 offsetting of the large Googles, Microsofts and the others. If we talk about the chemical and material industry, 100 euros, 150 euros per ton CO2, peanuts. Re reality in the chemical industry today, if you want to switch, is 500 to 1,500. And if we allow these guys to offset at the level that it is today, basically we are giving them leeway to avoid innovation investments and just pay to Estonia, just take your land and put some trees and we are okay at 100 euros per ton. 
chemical industry, we cannot allow that, otherwise the innovation will not come. And like I said in the beginning, my hat is coming off from the PBI, uh, CBE and PIC because uh, the network that we have built in 10 uh, years, the collaboration throughout the value chain, it's invaluable. We have a same floor, same table, we can discuss these things. And now we just need to put a little bit more effort also on the regulative side. So, um, thank you. So, thank you, Pete, for your very clear presentation and already setting the scene for the panel discussion that we're going to have. So, Pete, you're more than welcome to take a seat over here. I think, ladies and gentlemen, what you've clearly explained to you is that we have to move on many promises that are being made to concrete action to make sure that this <coughs> sector will fly indeed. Um, I think later on we're going to discuss more into detail also how you moved from the initial phase to the phase where you're in right now, the future project projects, the valley of death that you experience, but there are many multiple valleys of death, so we'll definitely look into that as well. But before that, I don't want you to be alone in the panel, it's always good to have peers. So therefore it is my great pleasure to also introduce to you the other panelists. Uh, so first of all, Julie Persson, who is the project coordinator and communication corporate at Microfeed. So Julie, please take the floor. Please give her a big hand. <laughs> well, I'd like to welcome Pepti Oynonen, the CEO and founder of Eco Helix, who is also involved in the vehicle project. Great to have you too. <laughs> Next up, Christophe Louvel, the Head of Industrialization and Financing Bioeconomy for Change, B4C. Great to have you too. <laughs> Pierre Giuseppe Morone, Vice Chair of the CB Joint Undertaking Scientific Committee and full Professor of Economic Policy. Thanks for joining us. to welcome Pavel Misiga, Head of Units within the European Commission's Director General Research and Innovation. Great. So yeah, I think, once again, Pete, thanks for, for setting that scene um, and, and to have a broader introduction of what you could do with your company, how you push the boundaries, but at the same time also experiencing the different kind of barriers and we are going to discuss that into lengthy detail uh, today. But before that, um, I think it's also good to kind of check his uh, narrative also against some other stories because we have people from industry here, from SMEs, we have people from the more policy perspective here to see if there's a match, perhaps there's a mismatch, we need to make some changes, so that is what we will be discussing. So I'm just going to start on that side. I know Pete, you already gave your introduction, so, Patty, may I ask you to tell us a little bit more about EcoHelix and the problems that you face with also, ladies and gentlemen, I think we want to remain positive too. So, let's also celebrate what is actually going well. So, Patty, the floor is yours to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Petri Ahnen is my name, CEO and founder of EcoHelix. Um, first of all, I'm feeling very honored to be here today. I'm invited to be a panelist among all of these distinguished people. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invite. A little bit about Ecohelix, uh, how we began. Uh, the story actually began uh, in the rainforests of Brazil. <laughs> so uh, I was studying their uh, fungal uh, degradation processes. I got really inspired uh, by the wonderful carbon cycles that uh, these forests have. I studied these uh, processes and found out how Biomimicking, which Ecohelix process actually is, could actually work in an industrial setup. And, um, but yeah, if backed by a strong knowledge in uh, process technology and, and chemistry. So, uh, but then the actual Ecohelix company uh, was then started at the Royal Institute of Technology, where I was uh, doing my PhD studies in Stockholm. Uh, in Sweden, we have a very good uh, support to. Uh, startups and and actually the IP that is produced at the universities uh, belong to the researchers so that's a very good starting point obviously so being able to secure IP in the early stage enabled me to start Ecohelix 
we started the development work. Then we uh, got uh, some financing, uh, national financing from uh, Swedish Innovation Agency, Vinnova. Uh, but it was really the uh, cooperation with Genera uh, and the start of our BBI project, <coughs> uh, same project where Fibano was also joining us. And that really kick-started Ecolix's journey. Uh, and, um, yeah, really these early financing uh, programs, great industrial partners and, and financing partners were uh, very important to get us uh, where we are today at Ecohelix. So at Ecohelix today, uh, we produce biopolymers, from, uh, which we call waters, from uh, side streams, uh, from certain pumping processes. We have a demo production established at the Dungeo Fabrik mill. Uh, these polymers can be used uh, in various applications, in, in packaging, construction, textiles, and cosmetics. Uh, right now we have 14 persons <coughs> in the company, uh, from uh, starting as a one-man one show. Uh, and our technology and product is uh, ready for the market. Next step right now from the demo production is that we uh, uh, scale up our demo production to 500 tons per year capacity and then uh, go from there uh, to the, the large scale at the Dungeo of Breaker Mill. This, is, uh, this strategy choice is really governed by um, yeah, what we're going to be speaking about uh, today. So at this stage, it's uh, when things get much more difficult, as you're facing, facing the market forces, obviously, and big players are finding out about your technology. So persistence, like Pep said, good, mark, good partners and investors that have a really long-term view are very important. So we have found some of these partners uh, that really understands the timescales that are required for these kind of developments. So a green trans transition requires really long-term thinking and support from industry regulations and financing instruments. It requires that all stakeholders keep their cool, so to say, and not back on, onto the old habits and not commit to what is needed to perform this uh, work. So I hope that this uh, panel discussion today gives some light to these aspects and yeah, really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Patrick, for your input. I really can see already a kind of like a red thread between the story of Pip and your thread. You, you talked about uh, persistent money. You talked about having a lot of patience, uh, also patient money in that sense. Uh, and also good to know that you're also celebrating the achievement already and the funding that you got and the support of the BDI now with the CV. So I think that's very good news that has been instrumental for you. But now, indeed, the tricky part starts with the scaling phase, which we'll come to in just a second. But first, Judy, may I ask you to give your input? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the scale project and microfit experience. Uh, I'm working, I joined Microfit three years ago uh, to, uh, to the corporate aspect and to build uh, the scale project, a flagship project uh, supported by CV first B uh, BBIGU, the ex of CBIGU. And um, Microfit is a company located in the south side of France, created more than 15 years ago. And it's a very, um, has presented like all over here, its bio-based model is a very uh, capital uh, intensive capital model. That's why uh, it's uh, long term and we, are, uh, we all need uh, a lot of uh, different sources of funds of financing. Um, in France, we are very, uh, well helped by banks and by uh, region, etc. at the early stage, so that was very quite easy to do it uh, at the stage of uh, the history of microfit. And then um, we won um, a semi instrument like uh, a, a IC accelerator now. What about Horizon <coughs> Europe? instruments indeed. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. so it was a very important instrument for us because uh, it helped us to uh, 
The demo, the technology was okay, but it was important to demo at the demo level and to work on the biomass and moreover to how to valorize the biomass because we are working on microalgae biomass and we want to uh, transform, extract very interesting ingredients, molecules of microalgae for the food, food supplement, feed and cosmetic sectors. And so, uh, we, thanks to the instrument, uh, we develop a pilot scale uh, of units of DSP and it helps us as well to, um, to face with some aspect of regulation <laughs> and it's very important as well. Uh, we were able to put on the market the first ingredient of food supplement in the US for the moment and uh, it helps us as well to demonstrate to founders that it was interesting to invest in microfit and so in 2019 we had a um, um, fundraising of 28 million euros with some capex uh, oriented uh, funds and some uh, research oriented funds and it helped us after to uh, have a flagship uh, the first of its kind microbiology <coughs> biorefinery we began again two years ago and it's still going on and uh, it's very important to continue to go on Last year, L'Oréal decided to invest in the company, so uh, CBAG support is a good visibility for the companies as well. L'Oréal is a minority shareholder, so we still uh, have uh, all the decision if we want. And, uh, and uh, the story is continuing. Continue. Um, Regulatory aspect is very is an issue for us today because we are working on new species of microalgae for food application. So uh, we are building novel food dossier. We are submitting novel food dossier. It took a long, 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 long time, and we are not so sure to have it. So long time and a lot of money. So <laughs> now uh, what we what we this kind of company could need it is a uh, late uh, late leverage uh, late fund late stage fund to continue it's very important to to help companies at all the stage to to get the market and to to get strong during this time thanks a lot for those inputs as well indeed it's very capital incentive um, in terms of um, on the whole chain indeed and for the latest stages capital is needed as well. Um, I was um, a bit struck when you said we have the first food supplement actually in the US market and not on the European market, so that's a kind of a sign as well, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes it's, a, it's a paradox because we are supported by Europe on the one hand and on the other hand, we are not allowed to, to commercialize our ingredients uh, on the market for the moment, whereas it is commercialized in the US. Yeah. And it's the same dossier to build, to, to proof. Yeah. Uh, so we need your favorable conditions, and I think people are already also threw something in the box where you clearly said, okay, perhaps we need a kind of a tax-free zone uh, also to be able to show, ensure that those innovations land in the EU market itself, not just being funded by the EU, but also land on the European market. But we'll come to that uh, in a second. Um, great to have you as well, Christoph, um, from the perspective of the largest bioeconomy cluster in Europe. So happy to give you the floor. Yes, thank you. One of the largest. Yes. One of the largest. Yes. So my name is Christophe Luguel. I've been working from, for the French, for the cluster B4C by Chemie for Chance since 2007. Even if you don't believe what I'm saying, but it was a long time ago. And the same year Microfit was funded. It is. <laughs> and uh, the mission of the cluster is very, uh, very simple, is to boost the competitivity of industry through open innovation on bioeconomy. So we did a success. 
um, uh, more than uh, 300 project finance, more than 3 billion euro invested uh, from, from lab scale to, uh, to, to, to industry. Within this activity for B4C, uh, it was the former name was IAR, I was involved in the early birth of what became later BDI. As the adventure started, I remember it, in November 2009. Uh, and, uh, and the first meeting with the European Commission was on February 28, 2012, and after we split up. And, uh, and we uh, got, uh, I think, a lot of success with, with BBI and uh, a lot of lessons to learn with BBI and, C, and, and, C, and CBE. Part also of my mission. Maybe that's why also I'm here, is to help our members uh, to speed up the innovation process and industrialization, especially uh, SME and uh, startups. Yes, I forgot to mention that within our cluster, 500 members, 550 now, we have more than we have around 100 startups, and most of them are industrial startups, so my only service provider. And, uh, and uh, since 2018, we uh, help these startups to, to develop this flagship proposal, successful, and one of the great examples is my profit, of course. And within the 15 flagship financed by BBI CBE, CBE from 2014, we won five. So one set. So we have good experience. Not maybe for the first time, but we will submit and we won. So I have a good experience of what other enemy success factors. And uh, and uh, what and what is sometimes frustrating, most of the time enjoying, is that there's always new hurdles or the, the, the pathway is not so easy as we thought at the beginning, and still hurdles uh, and challenges to face. And I think that the presentation from people is very good. And it's, it's, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of. Herders that have addressed it's a very honest presentation. We need that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember, and, was, and we stopped here, that in, from 2007 and 2009, I was coordinator of a CSA project uh, for, uh, for, it was FP6, I know it's a long time ago, for help <laughs> for the elders and the member of biorefinery bio bio development in Europe. And that, they are exactly reflected in the presentation. So a lot of work still to do. And uh, on special issue, I'm happy yes, to discuss in the committee. Very good, because that's what we need to discuss. Are we then moving ahead when some of the obstacles that we were already researching and examining in FP7, which is uh, already a long time ago, um, yeah, if they have been overcome, if new hurdles came into existence, or if we kind of like stopped by those kind of different hurdles and we simply can't overcome them. But We'll come to that. Um, first of all, Pierre Giuseppe, um, you're going to bring a whole new perspective because you're not working for a company, you're not working for a cluster, you are a professor and you're also looking into green bonds, standards and so on. So happy to hear from you. Yes, thank you Charlotte. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as you were mentioning Charlotte, yes, I'm a professor of economic policy uh, and uh, of course uh, I will bring a different uh, perspective, a different view on the topic that will be addressed in this uh, roundtable today. Um, as a social scientist, uh, I'm mostly looking at uh, market-related and consumers' uh, behavior aspects associated with the transition to a, a, a green circular bioeconomy. This is quite relevant because, uh, I mean, as you probably know, there's always the two sides of the coin. So on the one hand, we have the technological side, which is the supply side, which needs to develop. And then on the other hand, we need to match these technological developments with a growing demand for these new products or different kind of products. Uh, so this is, the, this is the demand side. And we have to understand what are the mechanisms undergoing in the development that occur from at the, at the, demand, at the demand side. I'm also the vice chair of the CBEJU committee, as um, Charlotte was mentioning, uh, which gives me um, a picture, a, a, a good picture of uh, what is uh, going on 
in terms of projects funded at, uh, at European level, especially within the CBD. <laughs> And um, another thing that I'd like to mention uh, here today is that I've also, I'm also the uh, editor-in-chief of a new, uh, newly launched uh, Elsevier journal, which is called Societal Impact. It's uh, relevant uh, for me to mention this here today because uh, this is a journal that was uh, uh, developed by Elsevier, which is one of the largest uh, uh, publishing uh, house uh, for academic, uh, for the academic uh, in, in the world. Uh, Expect precisely to show that uh, there is a, a need for social impacts of the research that we are conducting as uh, professors, as researchers uh, in the lab, outside the lab. But we have to show that there is a social impact and what we are doing is having an impact. And I think that uh, the whole area of topic uh, associated with the transition to a circular bio based economy has a tremendous social impact. And, and are we are looking at the positive societal impact and the negative. I wish you. Uh, yes. We talked about externalities as well. Um, so, so is that included in your research as well? Yes, okay. uh, of course. Uh, I, I have in mind the positive social yeah. impacts of this, uh, of this uh, uh, ongoing transition. And I think that this is very important to show it clearly because when you mention externalities, uh, I mean, this is the, the very reason why we can claim for a strong policy support for this transition because there are externalities out there. And we need to create a, a level playing field for this uh, new... I, I will come back on this later on, anyway. Uh, so, yes, uh, I, will, I think I will stop here. And uh, as I said, uh, most of my research... I, I created the Bioeconomy Transition Research Group at the Thermos Sapienza, which is my university. And we are conducting uh, this uh, social uh, science-oriented research in the bio-based uh, economy. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Giuseppe. And I, you mentioned three very important works strong policy support. Now it happens to be that Pavel's actually working on policy, so we're happy to learn a little bit more from your perspective what you would like to bring uh, to the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. And thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to see successful BBI or CD project, although I, I, I understand that our support uh, helped you in certain phase, but you are now you, you face other challenges that, uh, that we need to tackle. Um, my name is Pavel Misik, I am head of, uh, of the Green Transitions Unit in DJRTD. Uh, our unit is responsible for the, the partnership, CBE and BBI before. But we are dealing also with uh, many other issues and one, one of the green transitions that we would like to, uh, to, to promote and stimulate is, is uh, is the transition to bio-based uh, bio economy. Um, so we, we are studying a lot of, uh, lot of issues and in particular we are interested in barriers. What, what uh, holds this transition uh, back? And uh, we very often hear from stakeholders that it is, uh, it is the lack of investment, access to finance, etc. And our experience, and I will, I will use one example that perhaps will introduce us to the, to the topic of this, uh, of this panel discussion. For example, there is a study of, of JRC, the, the, the scientific branch of the Commission, that analyzed the potential for, for bioeconomy, especially for, for biorefineries, and, and they, they only look at, uh, at uh, some waste flow. So, for example, there is about uh, 30 million ton of waste from uh, from food industry just in from processing of four four crops, uh, and and this this material could be could be a feedstock for they estimated about 200 biorefineries in Brazil. So we these are perfectly uh, viable, economically profitable. Uh, technologically mature um, solutions, uh, so we know where they could be based on, on food industry localization, etc. And we expected that, and, and I spoke to, to uh, financial institutions, and, and the problem is that we don't see that that these economically viable, profitable biorefineries are not built. So we ask, uh, ask financial institutions, what's the problem? Why are, are you investing? And 
basically tell us we don't see bankable projects. We, do, we don't see proposals from from companies that, that we could invest. There's plenty of money. We want to invest that that we don't see investment projects. So so something is wrong. This, these two positions of, of industry that says we need money, we need we need viable solutions. On the other side, financial institutions that we don't see that. Yeah. You know, so how can we bring these these two things together? And uh, and indeed, they, when we ask what specifically uh, prevents you to invest, the financial institutions say there is a lot of risk, there is technological risk, so I think that it is inherent risk of, of, of new solutions. Um, and there, is also, um, there is also policy, policy risk. So for example, banks told us we don't want to go again through the biofuel experience we had. So a lot of optimism, a lot of investment opportunities, but then public and policy backlash. So that's that's a problem. So what is what is the future of, of, of biomass sectors? And, and the third type of risk is 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 the market risk. And and I hear from industry that there is there is uh, simply not enough demand and they point again to, to policy and regulation. So on one side sometimes it is regulation that that uh, kind of uh, uh, hinders the demand. On the other side sometimes we hear that there is a lack of regulation that would stimulate uh, stimulate demand. Um, but that this sector is so so broad and and there are millions of, of bio-based products. We cannot regulate everything. We cannot regulate the whole economy. And to, uh, so obviously it, it is possible to address uh, the regulation that, is, that, is, that, that creates barriers. And this is possibly the priority. But, but we cannot have economy based on regulation. So how, how can we reconcile this, uh, the, the, the things? I, I can speak about what we are proposing and how we are collaborating with, uh, with the financial, <coughs> financial sector. We, well, we can do so in a second. Okay. If Very that's good. okay, then we'll, so we'll bring it back again. My question is how yeah. we can reconcile these two uh, exactly, because contradicting th 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 There's a lot that needs to be reconciled. Uh, Pipa saw you nodding a couple of times. You already discussed with us the kind of risks that you have faced uh, at the beginning. Or technological risks, would you say that's still a risk for you or less so? Like, from a technological perspective, you are mature enough and you're mainly facing now regulatory and market barriers. Could you comment on that? I need that term. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we really are in the second value of theft today. Yeah. In the second value of theft, so maybe I painted a very dark picture, but let's say on the demonstration plan point, the volumes is dropping the ocean, so we can find the partners there who are ready to move, but in the end it's a kind of a more marketing related uh, collaboration, not really the industrial commercialization. But to really go against the market, to give a long term uptake for our uh, first large plan by next year, end of next year, well, it's, uh, people are not really willing to do so because uh, it, it is a kind of competitive advantage loss for them because others don't need to move. And uh, for me, this uh, we are not asking money. I think the lessons is learned that don't put certain euros per megawatt hour subsidies on the market. Make uh, subsidies that incentivize sectors to start innovating. I think the SAF is very, very, very good example because they set standard that everybody needs to start moving and thinking how we innovate otherwise we will have doubled the price that uh, would be the innovation and then i can assure you if the different parties of the value chain private companies start to innovate they have the same struggle the final user all of us we will get the best cost efficient but the sustainable product on the market and then we need a kind of a transition phase, let's start with the 2% then we go annually to 1% higher or let's set the pace and in 20 years I think the prices of the without externalities and uh, sustainable will be leveled. 
So we don't need cash, we need just playing field that supports the innovation on the market and helps us grow to get competitive with the technologies that have been which, which place do you need for that? Which place do you need to further grow? Uh, that you can further innovate and that we can just do away with the hurdles that we face currently? Well, on one hand, yes, there are regulations. If you go on the sector and specific product level, you have very different regulations that are, uh, let's say, stopping the innovation getting on the market. But uh, for me, the big evil is, uh, green deal is about leaving the virgin fossil in the ground and defossilizing the industry. And we just need to promote that on a general level. I so we need to de-incentivize that that all brown industry and incentivize yeah. the, the, the green economy and that's also something that you discussed before yes. there's a lot of talk about that that we need to incentivize and what you actually experience into practice that is still not the case you have a beautiful product but then the offtake is still a huge problem for you yeah, for me it's a question that we have the green deal where everybody understands that we are moving towards something but what it is yeah. it's not defined and uh, I showed the picture that is the black and the green base. So you see that the whole industry is preparing. They are testing all different things, but they are all waiting for something. And they are waiting for uh, this aviation. Why I do it? Why I say it? Because if you bring this sample today to chemical industry, yeah. they start thinking about it. Okay, if this is coming, we need to be prepared. But you need, you need a lot of first movers. Yeah, there was a stale you need thing. Something, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, everybody understands it's coming. So yeah. I think that. There is no question about it that the bioeconomy will be here and it will grow. Question is not question when. Question is at what yeah. pace. And I would yeah. say that uh, we, are, we have a lot talked about different things. We are very easily standing up and starting to make first steps. But we need to run. We need to sprint. Because otherwise because others will, will do it. It's uh, not just us. marathon. Yeah. Yeah. We need to sprint the marathon. It's not just marathon. It's the ultra marathon. Exactly. On the mountains. But, but, we but, need to come and start moving it together. Petri and uh, Julia saw you nodding happily. Can you perhaps respond to that from your perspective and the phase that you're in uh, with your company? Yeah, no, I would just like to comment that um, I feel all of these projects, well, everything boils down to the market risk. Uh, there's, uh, in my opinion, no such thing as, a, let's say, bio based market. Uh, sure, there are bio-based production methods, but the market demand comes from the applications. Uh, it's not the bio-based that uh, drives an application uh, all the way to the market. So what, what we're facing with is, uh, yeah, of course, if you generalize the uh, oil-based uh, solutions that have been for decades optimized, uh, have the huge advantage from the economy of scales um, and in some cases even subs subsidies that uh, and, and, and bio-based solutions need to compete in that uh, in, in that landscape um, yeah so, so it's, it, it's, it's not an easy sector uh, but yeah. it's a very promising one and I can understand that many factors at play at the same time um, they also said, well, we kind of need a vision for the sector. We're moving towards something, but we actually don't know what we're moving to. Is that the kind of feeling that you have as well, uh, Julie? And also, for, uh, perhaps Christoph can comment afterwards, also based on the cluster vision, how you see that. So, do you have an idea? Where, where are we moving? Where do we stand in 20 years' time? Do we have enough funding? Do we have enough demand and up uptake? Concerning the market and the consumer demands, I think it's important to go back to this first. Um, Bio-based is very uh, trendy, and moreover with this COVID crisis, so uh, I think it's very important. Uh, the awareness of consumer is uh, going uh, faster and faster about this. There are a, a real demand after do they have the money to buy it is another question, but uh, it's here, it's our job to do and to uh, propose something on the market at a good price, with good uh, things to produce it, a good way to produce it, that's sustainable, and um, all 
tools we have until flagship is good tools, really. But the stubborn uh, desk by desk is here and it's real, really. And if you want to do world leader in value based, it's important to take into account this aspect. Because in some other continents, it's yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. And we have to keep in mind this. Yeah. And then, of course, we still need to play by uh, uh, level playing field market rules because it tends to be that in some continents you have like kind of perverse incentives that shouldn't be there, of course. But uh, I mean, we always try to be the good guy in, in Europe uh, and to push things in, in the right way just on our own strength. But sometimes you need a bit of more like uh, input, investment, effort, financial commitment to get you through that final valley of death, if I understand correctly. Yes. Good. Um, Christophe, do you see the same experiences with the, the companies and clusters that, that you represent? Uh, yes, but I will express differently. Please. Yes, uh, when you see there's no demand, there's no uptake and so on, it, it depends on what price, the matter is the price. If you match the price of the competition, right, then you get to market. Uh, but uh, you compete against an established industry that have optimized their process for 90, 400 years. And so, uh, the only, we can summarize in one, one word, it's time. It's, it's, uh, uh, it takes time. And I was not aware of uh, this is the concept of the second level of death. But I think it's a good one, because... So is there a discrepancy then between the time that you would like to have and the time being given by you by investors, for example? Because probably uh, with the increased interest rates right now, the market conditions, the capital conditions are less favorable than a couple of years ago, where they want to see results immediately. So probably your timeline yeah. is about 15 to 20 years, and they would be happy to get concrete results in like five years time, to put it black and white. It is, yes, exactly. That's for the private investor. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so maybe yeah. there are so maybe VC or in, in the assistants, they will jump at me if I say that. Best, uh, not most of them, less and less. But a uh, couple of years ago, most of them want to invest into IB, industrial biotech, or biofinery process, or uh, uh, and have their return of investment after five years. Just forget it. We are not in the IT. We need based on our experience. Uh, 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 um, biorefinery technology, whether it's chemical or biotech or what you want, from a proof of concept and uh, you could do uh, it to for the first month, it's minimum five, 15 years. 15 years. And sometimes it reaches 22 years in one example. So you must be patient. You must be very patient. Patience, time. Yeah. Yeah. And we say about risk. You say the risk of the size of the car. <coughs> I would say a triple size of the coin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really strong coin. Uh, uh, strange coin, I know, but it, to invest in biorefinery, in bioeconomy, you have a triple risk. First, you must secure the feedstock. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, and, and the feedstock are already used. And, uh, and uh, so you must secure the value chain, and that's a real hurdle, challenge. So that's why, by the way, it gives competitive advantage to the primary sectors, I mean, to the agro industry uh, and to the forest industry. So on vertical integration, so they, can, they have a competitive advantage on that. Uh, uh, however, uh, yes, because bioeconomy is based on biomass and not on fossil resources. So the first one is the problem of the feedstock, yes. so that's yes. easier. The second point. one is technology. Because the technologies that have been developed, developed in the last Century uh, to optimize everything from fossil feedstock, coal, and then oil to products uh, in a very efficient way are not the same if you want to do the same thing for biomass. Or you have to do uh, not, uh, not the same technology. I mean, uh, uh, even if it is uh, the biology tool, is most of the time the most efficient one, but not only chemical. Could, could give yes, fantastic results, uh, but it's not the same time of chemistry. You have to develop a new chemistry, and uh, I speak on the control of the professor James Clark, where 
this is here. Uh, uh, we had the same discussion 15 years ago. And, uh, and you have to adapt uh, yes, to, 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 to develop new technology and the selection of technology and it takes time. And two, so the technology developed are very ca highly capitalistic. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that. It's not only for micro it's very, for everything. Very capitalistic. Very capitalistic. So yeah. if, capital, if it is highly capitalistic, you need high risk. Yeah. Capital intensive, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Capital and the third, intensive. And, and the third point? Yeah. And that you need this pilot demo. Yeah. And don't skip the, the uh, uh, no, no shortcuts, step by step. Yeah. Be patient. And, uh, and, and, and three is market. I would introduce policies in the market. And uh, uh, because uh, unless you have a two digit worth of I, uh, economy, there is class, class for newcomer, you have to make your own place. Of course, if you replace one uh, fossil to an equivalent product, that's obvious. But even for a new one, the, the need that addressed is already addressed uh, by the market. You are not in IT, uh, when Steve Jobs created the iPad concept, there was no equivalent. He created the need. Yeah. You, can, you don't have that in bioeconomy. No, you have to displace the design. existing one. Yeah. And they will fact yeah. to, 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 to do exactly. So, but I think the all this combination the, is... The fight has really started yeah. already many years ago, right? I mean, yes, we're, we're talking, mean, especially during COVID times, we've talked all the time about strategic autonomy, where also one of the key technologies is biotechnology. So, there is a kind of a policy incentive uh, uh, to make a difference, also knowing that we need to move ahead, and Europe has clearly said we want to do that. And then you need time. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. I mentioned that I was as a coordinator of this project, Hodgson yeah. and Abrams, yeah. of yeah. biorefinery development in Europe, 2007, 2009. Yeah. You know that came first? The hurdles that came first? It was not the technology, it was not the biomass, it was not the price, it was the lack of consistency of policy support yeah. Yeah. in Europe. Okay, so we'll, we'll come it, to it that in, 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 a, in a second, perhaps. Uh, First of all, what I'd like to do is to engage you a bit as well. Uh, so I'd like to put up on the screen the first slide of question that we have prepared. And I'm happy to get your input as well on this particular question. And the question that we have here for you is what, from your perspective, because you might be working for a SME, you might be working in education and research uh, within government, from your perspective, what is the biggest barrier to access funding? Is that A, market, B, uh, regulatory, C, technological, or D, all of the above. So we would be happy to see how the audience is responding to that. If you would say all of the above, we have a huge problem, of course, because <laughs> there's so much to tackle. Yeah, exactly. We'll stay all day here and have the whole evening to discuss. Let me see if there are some results coming in. So I'm just looking at the technicians. Can we see some results? Because I can see we have 23 people. Yeah. Okay, still regulatory. Yeah. So that's uh, what the position and uh, uh, position is of the audience here. Uh, and we're happy to discuss that. Um, Giuseppe, a question also for you. Uh, yeah, Pierre, Joseph, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're happy to discuss, and we already discussed the, the different values of death, that we need this right kind of incentives. And I know we discussed before as well, what can we do to make and create those incentives also for financial institutions that they're willing to invest? That because we say we have beautiful products here, we have uh, technologically viable uh, uh, products and technolo technologies that really work into practice. Um, you talked about premiums, for example, as well, creating standards. Will that be the, like the, the silver bullet that we need for the bioeconomy? Before I go back to, the, yeah. get to your question, yeah. I want to uh, go back to one point uh, that was made uh, by uh, Christopher before, Christoph before uh, in his uh, talk. He was mentioning about price. So we need to uh, have uh, products that are matching uh, the price of uh, products that are already on the market. This is true, but we know very well by now that the market price, uh, as they are created uh, in uh, now capitalist economy, 
uh, as we know it today. They are not reflecting the externalities that all of you have been uh, talking about. So this is a, it, this is a major distortion. You see, so we cannot expect that that the, the it's not just the, the bioeconomy, the circular bioeconomy, but the, the future economy where we have learned that there are system boundaries, uh, that there are limitations of what the humankind can do on this planet, uh, we will still refer to that kind of prices. Those prices are not suitable for a world that has boundaries. Okay? If there are no boundaries, that mechanism works. If there are boundaries, then there are externalities, then that, that mechanism doesn't work. So this is something that we have to bear in mind. There is a major transition that is going to occur this transition is uh, actually way bigger than the circular bio-based economy is part of this major transition, okay? So this is the, the, the first thing that I want to make. So if there are these boundaries, then we have to, go, I don't have to make one of the policy makers, the role of politics into all this transition. Because then we have to make uh, a play, uh, level playing field. Yeah. You've been mentioning this, uh, this, this concept of a level playing field. Uh, so there are uh, several issues uh, that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about creating this level playing field. And then I go to your question about uh, standards yeah. uh, and green and so on. So how do we create a level playing field? Exactly. Yeah. How do we create it? One of the good things that has been done, uh, made attempt uh, this year, was uh, the CDM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. This is a one, one way for creating this level playing field. Uh, we have to remove uh, subsidies uh, to uh, oil uh, production, to, oil, uh, to, to, to the oil industry. Just in Italy, this is my personal experience when I was working as an economic advisor of the Italian Ministry of the Environment, just in Italy there are 2 billion euros that go as subsidies, environmentally harmful subsidies to oil uh, industry. Industry. So this is something that we have to remove if we want to create this level playing field. Then there is uh, the other side of the coin. Then there is the, uh, the consumer side of the coin, uh, the investor's side of the coin. So those people that are going to buy those products uh, or are going to put their savings uh, into these uh, new emerging startups. So the pool of push uh, exactly. yeah, yeah. So yeah. What, 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 what can we do in order to stimulate consumers, to stimulate investors towards this? So, we need to make, uh, we need to reduce uh, the information asymmetry uh, that there is uh, between uh, the technological side, the producer side, and consumers. This is one major problem. There is a, an information asymmetry, and this is a, a, a classical example, along with the uh, externalities, this is a classical example of market failures. If we have asymmetric information, then the market fails. Okay? So how do we reduce these uh, asymmetries? We reduce providing consumers and investors reliable information, reliable assessment of the sustainability of products, of the sustainability of new investments. Because if I have a green new, what is the green new? The green new is the green premium that an investor is willing to pay in order to make sure that his money is going to finance a green activity. But if the investor is not, uh, does, not, does not have uh, sufficient information to discriminate between what is green and what is not, what is really green and what is not really green, then it comes the whole issue about greenwashing and how this can be dangerous for the transition to happen and how this can be uh, say, a major hurdle for the transition. So if the, the investors or the consumers on the, on the consumption side do not have sufficiently trustable, reliable information on the green, uh, the green value of these new products or these new investments, that's a, that's then huge. it's very dif difficult for them to make, uh, to make a, a huge, choice. That's a huge problem then, because basically those people, the good guys, are kind of like caught in the middle where you said, okay, we need to have the reliable uh, picture, the reliable narrative. That means that apparently there are companies, there are individuals that are kind of inflating the story Telling up a better, uh, greener, more optimistic picture than in reality, also hindering the good guys from then access, uh, getting access to the funding. Yeah, yeah, this is absolutely true. Uh, we conducted a study uh, in my uh, research group yeah. about uh, the green yeah. and uh, this was a field experiment done with uh, investors. Uh, 
uh, at different scale. Uh, and what we have learned from this experiment is that uh, if consumer investors, potential investors, receive uh, the wrong information, so they receive an information saying this investment is a green investment. So invest investors have to choose between green and brown investment. If they receive an information about an investment being green and then they realize that the investment is, was actually not green but was a brown investment, uh, and they receive it in a subsequent uh, occasion, one after the other, then they become completely discouraged. And even though they, they were willing to invest and they put their money on green investment, they will never again revert to green investment. Okay? So it's not just that I'm getting disappointed by this one occurrence, but the problem is that it's something that can change the investor's mindset about green investment. Okay? So it can discourage the investment in green for in the long term. But did, did the research also find out that investors are willing to invest in real green investments even if the return on investment will be longer than in brown investments? Yeah, this but that's the question, right? Yeah, that's, that's something that we run into constantly in what we hear from the other panelists as this well. This is a very interesting uh, uh, point and this is uh, something that, that there has been a lot of research going on about uh, the green human when we talk about investment and the green premium when we talk about products. So are consumers willing to spend a bit more when they are going to buy something that they know in a reliable way that it's green? Are investors willing to give up part of their revenue uh, in their investment? So yes, there is uh, evidence about the existence of a premium, of a green premium. But what we are learning now in a, a new series of experiments that we are conducting is that most, in most of the cases, uh, this concern is really what I call a second order concern. Consumers, for example, are willing to pay an extra premium for green products, but only if they perceive it as something that has a short-term immediate impact, for example, on their health. Okay? So the concern is primarily about the impact of this product on your health, organic food. So these are short-term, tangible. Yes, yeah. yes, that's yeah. one. So yeah. the concern about the environment is a second-order concern. This is something that we should be. That needs more investigation. We need to understand it clearly how the mindset of the consumer is actually is actually working when it comes to the, the whole thing of green, green and green for uh, for investments. Okay, thanks for that. Um, it's a very interesting way of looking at things because sometimes uh, we just start from the research and innovation. We know there's a well, we hope there's a need. Uh, we try to make the world a better place, but the demand side and the consumer side, of course, is very, uh, very important in that sense. As well as whether investors are willing to take that investment, to take that risk, so to say. Uh, perhaps then I come to to Pavel as well. Um, I know the European Commission is also looking how to compensate that risk for investors, right? So how are you trying to play a role here from a policy perspective? Yeah, we, um, we understand all these arguments and, and analysis. These behavioral aspects are very interesting, new elements in the, in the analysis. But I think we need to find pragmatic solutions, you know. We, um, we understand there are harmful subsidies, but for decades we couldn't get rid of them because there are political reasons, pressures, other other interests. There is complaint about regulation. I understand that this is kind of harmful. What do you consider as harmful regulation? Uh, something that you perceive as prevents uh, bringing uh, wireless products on the market. This regulation is there for certain reason, and this is collateral damage. And and you call for other regulation that can eventually also have collateral uh, effects. So let's, and, and it takes time to change the, uh, earlier we, we heard from, from CEO of Norm in the, in the plenary speech, she referred to regulation that was just adopted, <coughs> in like uh, uh, packaging, packaging based uh, 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 regulation, etc. It is impossible to change it uh, very soon, it will be next. Uh, legislative cycle, so maybe five years. But what are what are pragmatic and immediate solutions? And we simply see that we need to address the risk, and we can address it on the side of industry, so to help them to 
to reduce certain elements like technology. This is why CB is here, to help to demonstrate technological solutions, etc. So, so many actions we can take on that side to help industry. And there are other actions that we can take on the side of, of financial institutions to, to help them to deal with, uh, with the risk. And in particular, what, what we are trying to do is that we use public funds to, to take part of the risk from the rest. So we, we are proposing uh, lending instruments where public and private capital is combined and instruments that have, let's say, layered structure and more senior and junior investors taking different level of risk, etc. So, but again... So knowing that, I would say investors are standing in line uh, to collaborate with you, no, because basically no, no, that, that back is that, being cut. We are, are mobilizing yeah. that. For yeah. example, within CBE, we are creating <coughs> what we call deployment group, because we realize that CBE is a partnership between uh, public, represented by the European Commission, using unions, uh, financial uh, finance, and industry. But there are other stakeholders that have important roles, <coughs> and, and financial sector is such stakeholder that is not partner in our partnership. So we we are creating a what we call deployment group for those stakeholders, and in this case financial institutions, we invite them. What we want to achieve is that they commit, they mobilize capital, and they commit that this capital will be invested exactly. in the next five years or something yeah. like that. Once they adopt that objective, suddenly within financial institutions, they address their lack of knowledge of the sector and, and, and create uh, instruments for, for them, etc. The second thing that we want to discuss with them is, is this innovative financial instruments. And we have an example. We have European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, where the European Commission put 150 million and we invited private investors to, to, to bring their capital and there is independent management of, of the fund. It's a basically venture capital fund and they invest in, in startups. But what we see is they go into food. We don't, 90% of their investment, yeah. because the rate of return is higher. Mm -hmm. And shorter. Shorter. Shorter? shorter. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, okay, so so the uh, uh, they, they, they get profit sooner. Mm -hmm. They are not very patient. Uh, uh, so so it has an effect this you, you, you didn't want to have. But this is the market. Happened. This yeah. is the market yeah. effect. So so yeah. once we, we we put the public money, combine it with, with private, it takes the, the the private logic of investing in in the most profitable profitable exactly. activities. But, that, but that, that that tipping point needs to come at some point of time, of course, where investors will say, cool. This is the sector where I want to invest. This is the next big thing that we need. And that is apparently still strong. I think yeah, Christoph, you want to This is what Christoph, yeah. Christoph yeah. said. That yeah. Unless there are new new, uh, new products that, that meet the, the, the new needs, yeah. it is profitable usually. That's, so we need to create we that, that new need like Apple did, but then in a different kind of setting. The majority, kind of, setting. majority yeah. of the sector is, is striving to replace something that is already there. So the, the need is met. Maybe with a suboptimal kind of product, yeah. we want something better. But in, in from market perspective, you know this is new product has to compete on uh, in, in in the market with the with the traditional products that are optimized, uh, etc. Et and, and, and that takes time, of course. That, that, that and that, that, time. that's one of the problems, right? That you don't get the time uh, uh, to showcase that what you have is actually. Uh, the next big thing. Uh, unless, but unless we have yeah. bio products that can compete with uh, with the traditional fossil-based products, yeah. then it, it will be very very so, difficult. So I'll check quickly also with, with Pete and, and Patrick and, and Julie, and then I'll give the floor to you, Christoph. Can your products already potentially compete with the more fossil-based products? For me, it's uh, like analog of uh, putting a three year infant uh, or a toddler and uh, you say, Bolt on the 100 meter line and say, uh, Run. Uh, it's, it's physically not possible. So, yeah. I, it, for, for me, to reflect back on this uh, ideas, I hate green people because it somehow says that we have a choice. 
It's not a choice. Green Deal means that we are collectively deciding that we will turn our economy into certain borders. And stick to it. And we stick with that. Yeah. It means that it's not the green premium, but it will be the uh, kind of basis of economy, how we do things. We cannot compare what has been done before and now what we want to do. These are totally different playing fields, and you cannot expect the same price. And for me, there are two options. So, either a philosophical question. So, uh, what this Green Deal about is to phase out from the fossils. Let's start capping the fossils. So, 2022, European Union, we have been using that much oil, that much coal, that much compressed natural gas. And all the growth that is coming further, we say no oil. No fossils. If you want to grow, you need to grow on the other innovative solutions. Or the other option is to be say by the mandates that you need to use sustainable sources on a certain level. One way or the other way, and then the whole industry that has been profiting from being outside the borders will be put the burden to drive the innovation and to drive the change. And that's policy. That's yeah. policy. Yeah. One Thank way you. or the other yeah. way, but it, it needs to be throughout the industry. So yeah. we say scope three, borders are like that, yeah. and you need to execute. And then the innovation comes from the market, and it, it's not kind of a bias, but we say that within this frame, everything that works, exactly. make it happen. Okay. That's right. Yeah, about uh, product performance, I think the question was also about, uh, we're actually in a very good position, one of our products is uh, working actually 10 times better than what is on the market. We, I don't know if it was luck or persistence or what it was, but then... Many factors probably. Uh, yeah, but then um, still establishing this large-scale units, uh, typically this kind of funds, uh, 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 the VC funds, they have a internal rate of return target of 15% uh, in a 5 to 8 year uh, timeline. Still, if you can then count that you, you have an implementation of the project of at least 2 years, or well, build time of at, at least 2 years, uh, it's still <laughs> very difficult to meet those IRR demands of yeah. the funds, yeah. Yeah. even though you have a yeah. product that uh, performs extremely yeah. well. But then again, as people said, need to remain persistent somehow yeah. as and it is because it, it's a fact of life of course in many different kind of industries on the roads you see um, fossil based uh, fuels cars you see teslas it's a bigger mix of different cars but in the end there will be change but not for now then we have a mix of everything which is still the same with like the oil refineries the bio refineries and in the end it needs to phase out and that's where the policy comes in but you perhaps to comment as well, and then this stuff I give you the floor to. Yeah. It's more about macroenergy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, macroenergy is uh, at the origin of the food chain, yeah. aquatic food chain, uh, the origin of all the plants on Earth. So um, we can find a lot of interesting molecules that uh, can replace fossil fuel, uh, fossil, fossil fuel based uh, ingredients. And um, for example, uh, how do you know why salmon flesh is pink like this? It's because a macroalgae produces an, a pigment called astaxanthin. We are able to synthesize it with by chemistry. It's cheaper, but it's not natural. And uh, another <coughs> example is uh, the, the oh, why L'Oréal decide to invest in our company. They have to, right? They yes, yeah. they decide to invest in our company last year because they have an objective of having by 2030, so in what's tomorrow, having 95% of their ingredients renewable, yeah. natural based. And that's, that's, that's a huge ambition and uh, fully with you that it's actually ridiculous that everything synthetic, synthetic is very cheap, but everything natural actually give, being given by us by Earth that we don't need to 
uh, uh, process in a very unfriendly, environment unfriendly way is very costly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and when you are uh, doing clinical studies, you are very implicit about the effectiveness of these ingredients. Exactly. Christophe. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, yes, I advise to be a patient and I'm impatient. <laughs> We have to react on three things. Yeah. First, on one of Pavel's comments and regulation. I do agree with you when you say you cannot regulate everything and, and we need regulation. We do need regulation. Regulation are here to protect the customers and citizens, I mean us and our children. But when you discuss with industry, they don't, most of the time, they don't complain at the regulation itself. They complain at the speed of the evolution and the adaption of regulation. Yeah, because probably when new regulation comes in and is coming into force, then the next big thing happens and then you have to wait another four to five years. And it's always a couple yes, of steps behind. For example, you exactly. buy your mamans, they yeah. depend on when you can see and they wait for five years yeah. because it's yeah. exactly the same exactly. thing. Yeah. Can I give you one inspiring example from Microfit? Their famous uh, uh, first product uh, where they, they got the FDA approval. Uh, they, they sell the product in USA. Without revealing too much secrecy, uh, uh, they, uh, they submit the dossier around the same time to the FDA and the European regulation. <coughs> and as, at the same time, they got the answer. 18 months, I don't remember exactly. One was the FDA approval. And was was a, a notification from agencies that they have opened the they have received the letter, the receipt, and they will read it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we're okay. laughing, but it's actually a problem. It's it's actually a problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it's, again, it's yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're still in Europe, so that's a good thing. You, you haven't decided yet to move over. We, we, and, uh, we want to stay in Europe. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah. after yes, yeah. it's important for us because exactly. without Europe and without France support, we won't be there today. And another Two. point? Yeah. Yes, second point, very important. We touch it, uh, uh, but uh, I will re insist on that. Uh, about this, you remember I, my triple risk uh, yeah. uh, biomass technology for technology, we yeah. have CBE and, 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 the market. Yes, and, so yep. and, and market regulation. Market. Uh, 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 it means that uh, I do agree with Fidener, it's not because you have your flagship. I'm not against the flagship. Of course, it's a fantastic tool to de-risk the, the pioneer, but it's not done. You don't have a rich critical mass with one flagship. You just deal with the first step and, and say, okay, my combination of technology, biomass, and market, it's possible, it's feasible, it could be bankable. So for that, you need time to replicate it. Replicate it. That's a deployment strategy. And better in Europe than outside of Europe. Exactly. So, yeah. so you need a long-lasting support yeah. of financial institution yeah. to de-risk the deployment strategy, the replication. Yeah. And that's and what Pete said: persistent money. Then, once again, yes. is what we need. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and that's why we created within the CBGU the deployment committee yeah. led by the yeah. European Investment Bank, and that's a fantastic news. And what I just hope that it will give uh, 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 concrete tools and uh, in, in line with the strategy. I just want to say, because we don't want another group that says uh, we want to do this as next steps, we make a lot of promises, but we need those actions as discussed before. Yes. Before, before we. Just to finish this second yeah, point, yeah. I have a third point that I can go later. Perfect. Uh, uh, in this same room, exactly four years ago, Less than week. We have our last BBIGU stakeholder forum. And the chairman of BBIGU at that time, Volkan Butcher, yes, said we have 10 flagship, it's fantastic. But for the next BBI, uh, uh, we don't need 10, we need 100 flagship. And that's the critical uh, mass that you want to 100 flagship yeah. of their replication. Yeah. And for that, I made a simple calculation you just need 10 million euros. 10 million or 10, 10 billion? billion. Okay. Just 10 to say million. Quite a difference. Not yeah. of grant, but of yeah. loan and guarantee yeah. Yeah. to support the replication. Yeah. Uh, uh, because you will not reach a critical 
maths from the day one, you will not uh, reach your, your price will not reach the commodity market. Yes. Uh, you have a couple of, of customers that can accept the premium, they, but it's not the majority, and they can invest but it. The second plan is the plan, and I do agree with Pete for, for, for Exactly, for and, and, and as identified, the funding itself, I mean, the amounts of funding out there, that's not so much the problem, it's just where the funding needs to go, which particular phase of the other. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> you need to have a vision. Yeah. I mean, if you accept that you need time to change the economy, to change the world, and, uh, and if you look at his history, uh, uh, the people they are not patient enough. Yeah. We are just human beings. Yeah. Most of the time in the history, the change came from outside. If well, the petrochemistry is exactly the same situation against the carbochemistry. And uh, uh, in the 30s, there was a quote, you can find it on Google, it's funny today, uh, that the, uh, the, um, uh, the CEO of ICI in the, in the 30s uh, says uh, there is nothing we can not do uh, with carbochemistry, petrochemistry has no future. Yeah, th th thanks for this. What came in between? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Second World War. Exactly. It's the yeah, Second World War was a game changer that changed everything and speed up everything. Yeah, but we so don't. Yeah, I and that's don't, what we, 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 don't yeah. misunderstand me. I don't hope <laughs> for the Second World War. Yeah. Even if we would have maybe have it without uh, yeah. wanting it. Well, people tend to say never waste a good crisis or in that sense of war, but let's not discuss that into detail yes, uh, today. It's, it's yeah. maybe the role yeah. of the public authority, the European Union, yeah. to give a vision and the long-lasting exactly. tools, set of tools. I prefer the Green Deal than the Second World War, it's yeah. my personal opinion. It's, I, I think we, we all tend to agree that we prefer a Green Deal over a war indeed. Yeah. Really, we have about five minutes left. I still want to give you the opportunity. Do you have a question for the whole panel, one of the panelists, then I'm happy to take that one on board. Yeah, please. If you could please state your name and organization, that would be wonderful. Walter Leute, Kai Leuven. So, a few issues. You talk about need for long term financing, but uh, you seek it uh, with groups of people and people who have a short term horizon. So, why not, for instance, involve pension funds by nature, they have much longer horizons, but my understanding is that the regulations at times prevent them from investing in these uh, risky projects. The second thing is you say we can't do everything with regulations, but if the fossil fuel industry needs to decrease, then why do we still allow investments by the fossil fuel industry to be tax deductible? It's very simple. You tell them, we don't want you to continue this, therefore any investment you do from today onwards will not be tax deductible anymore. Okay, then there's another point of regulations. The EU is supposed to create a single market. I've looked at the introduction of biocides. It's a disaster. Yes, there is a European regulation, but every country can translate it in its own territory in its own different way, which means that, in fact, there is no common market, there is no possibility. Final point, the customer will need to still buy things at a reasonable price. So if you cannot meet the same kinds of services, we can, of course, replace things by equivalent services, I'm not saying that, but if you cannot deliver the same kind of services to a consumer at comparable prices, you will impoverish this, the population tremendously and I'm not sure that uh, politically that's feasible. So there's a chance for you. And if you want a crisis, we don't need a third world war. We already have a climate crisis on our hands. So, Thank you for these very helpful inputs. Um, perhaps one of you wants to respond to this. I think the first point was regarding patient funding. Why don't you then, then attract the patient funding? Yeah, it's a very, very good remark. I will not, maybe, maybe not only pension funds, but insurance company. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Ins comp insurance company could be our best allies. Yeah. Because they think long term, and that's exactly that we need that bioeconomy becomes a game changer. Okay, good. Julie? 
Uh, it made me think things about uh, personal aspect. I, I'm thinking about my retire, and so I invest some my, some money in some funds. Yeah, and for a long time, I, I, I won't be retired today. Uh, more in France, so yes. Why not? Yeah. I would like to yeah, add yeah. uh, one of the points uh, that um, was made uh, by uh, you know, the audience. Uh, about reasonable prices. This is a very tricky question, this is a very tricky issue. What is a reasonable price? Now you go in a uh, supermarket, in a uh, company, in, in, in shops where they sell uh, garments, where they sell clothes. You go to the, uh, near the, the cashier and you buy a bundle of 100 hair uh, Extension. Extension. Yeah. The, the, the just cheap. the bundles. Yeah, yeah, just the bundles. Yeah. 100, okay? In 5 euros. Is this a reasonable price? What, what does it mean that you're buying a hundred of these rings at 5 euros? You have euros? difficult hair, I think. One, that's one, of it. <laughs> <laughs> it is one, one thing that you, you don't need 100. You just, you simply don't need 100 of them. So you're going to throw, most of them you're going to throw them away. You're going to lose them, you're going to throw them away. Second, it means that each of them has cost five cents. Five cents for feedstock, which is a fossil based thing. So, is it labor force? Where, is, where, where have they been produced? Probably in uh, some uh, faraway in places. Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, in so, is this a reasonable price? I don't think this is a reasonable price. So, the whole idea of what is reasonable. When it comes to price, I think it's something that we have to uh, start yeah. rethinking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Baffled as a as a final comment. Then I'm going to ask all of you a final question because we're running out of time. But luckily, we still have enough time afterwards to to enter into a discussion. I would like Baffled, to, to respond to the yeah. gentleman about the long term long term finance. So we are speaking also to uh, to these kind of investors. Uh, we look for perhaps uh, lower profit, but, but long term and secure profit. And this is what the, the, the problem, they, they don't see that, uh, that the level of risk is acceptable for, for their business. So this is why I say that we need to de-risk uh, investment in, in bio-based industry for all kind of investors. There are risk taking, the risk averse investors, etc. And the deployment group that we mentioned is exactly the platform to, to discuss that. But first we want their commitment uh, to, to invest so that they learn also about the specificity of the sector, they mobilize capital, they find the, the proper instrument that can deal with the risk and public authorities are willing to bring public money to contribute to this uh, uh, de-risking through, for example, European investment bank, national promotional banks, etc. So hopefully this initiative will address yeah. many, many of these problems. But again, the, 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 the regulation, I'm very sorry to, to say, there is majority of this sector, or if I can call it sector, is not regulated at all. So we are speaking about certain, certain segments where there is, we can call it harmful regulation, that has its, its purpose, that, that has negative impact, but the rest, is not regulated, so we cannot say that regulation prevents uh, bio. Uh, so, so you're basically saying that there's still enough. Well, this problem is, is, for example, price. I remember the, the last uh, uh, stakeholders forum. There was discussion. There was a representative of Fiat and said that we want to use bio-based plastics, and, and automotive industry is a huge user, of the second biggest user in, in our economy of, of plastic materials. And then there was somebody I don't remember who exactly uh, from the industry used to say, but we cannot compete at the moment with cheap fossil based plastics. But if price of oil exceeds $60 per barrel, we will be competitive. Look at the, at the price today. Yeah. We have $90, $90 per barrel, and, and we hear the same story. So we need to find solutions that can compete on the market. We cannot regulate. Yes, we can help with, with, with uh, carbon, you know, uh, border tax adjustment, 
and in, in general so, so climate we're, policies. We're, 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 not, we're not there yet. Uh, in the, in the, uh, so, sorry to stop you there, but because we're kind of short of time, but really okay. appreciate it. And I think uh, also the suggestion of the, the, the sir in the audience, uh, when we talk about taxes and what you mentioned as well, Pete, perhaps a, a tax-free zone? to make that the playground for the bio-based sector even, even bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, final question to all of you. And I ask you to answer with only one word. Very easy. And then, um, sorry for that, but if it's okay for you, we're going to take your question afterwards in a very informal way. Apologies for that. Final question to you. What is your wish for the bioeconomy in 10 years' time? Just one word. Easy. Peep. <laughs> <laughs> From niche to commodity. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah, that's one word. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Petri. Persistence. Persistence. Judy. For choice in nature. Perfect. Christoph? From niche to normal, as John Bell says. Okay. <laughs> you said? Yeah, yeah. I will just repeat it. From niche to normal. That's what From we are all aiming for. Uh, yes. Okay. 10 years is too short. Yeah. yeah. For me, it is a successful transition of, 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 the, of the sector, uh, which includes niche to norm, but that for me includes many more. That's the longest word I've ever <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Please give our panelists a big hand.